The President, please be seated. The President, the court is now back in session. Now the chamber is calling upon parties uh, to respond to the question uh, put forth by the chamber. And the defense team has uh, made their position clear that uh, they reserve the right not to respond uh, to the question now uh, up until they have consulted uh, with their respective clients. As for as uh, such, uh, tomorrow hearing uh, may not proceed because uh, the chamber would like to uh, leave uh, some time for the defense teams to uh, discuss and consult with their clients. Now, I would like to proceed to uh, point number seven, and I would like to put the question to the prosecution and the civil parties lawyers. The trial chamber indicated its uh, intention to proceed to a hearing of evidence in case 002-02 as soon as possible after the conclusion of case 002-01. As all factual allegations in, case, in relation to each potential sub-trial in case 002 from part of one consolidated indictment, might the trial chamber proceed with the hearing of the evidence in case 002-02 after the conclusion of the hearing of evidence in case 002-01 following a judicial recess sufficient to allow preparation by the parties for the next trial segment in par and in parallel with the drafting of the case 002-01 partial verdict. I would like to now hand over the floor to the prosecution. Thank you, Your Honours. Um, I think, actually, Judge Fenns partly answered this question this morning when she was emphasising to all of us how long it took to draft the judgment in the first case. I think Your Honour mentioned a figure of eight months. And I think now to be speaking of writing a judgment, starting another trial, time really running against us, I think we would find ourselves in a position where it would be very difficult to get a judgment in this case done and run a second trial at the same time and get that judgment within a reasonable period of time. So I share Judge Fenz's concerns in respect to this proposition. As you know, our position is to adopt option two of what the Supreme Court Chamber decided, that it would be one trial with reasonable representativeness of the charges in the closing order, and I've already given you my submissions on that. This particular proposition in 3.7 is looking to the first option that the Supreme Court Chamber offered. And I'll simply repeat the submissions that we've already made on this uh, since October of 2011 in the August uh, trial management session. We feel that there are pragmatic, technical, legal reasons why it would be extremely difficult to move to a second trial without a verdict or even an, a determined appeal in, in the first trial. You will recall that you made a press release on the 22nd of September of 2011, and in that press release you stated that the first trial would provide a basis to consider the role and responsibility of the accused and to provide a foundation for the remaining charges in later trials. Now, if you look at the severance order itself of 22nd of September of 2011, that's E124, you didn't address in that severance order how findings in this first case would be transmitted into this next portion or part of the case, the second trial. All that was stated 
and, you, and you'll find this in the operative part of that decision, was that further information regarding subsequent cases to be tried in the, case, in the course of case 002 will be provided to the parties and the public in due course. And you know, I don't need to say it, that that information has never been provided by the trial chamber and that the Supreme Court Chamber in its most recent decision of the 8th of February of 2013 recognise that fact, that there is no plan of how we're going to proceed into this second phase trial. Now, as I say, we've raised with you the concerns that we have of the legal difficulties in relying on findings made in this first trial, in any subsequent trial. Now, the possible mechanisms available to a court to rely on findings made in a prior case and to rely on those findings in a subsequent case are the doctrines of res judicata and judicial notice of adjudicated facts. Now, we've stated to you repeatedly that neither mechanism may be available to you before any appeal has been settled in respect of the first case. That's our real concern. And you yourselves have actually stated that there's no legal basis at the ECCC for you to take notice of judicially adjudicated facts. And that's a decision on an application by Yang Suri regarding judicial notice of adjudicated facts. Decision of the 4th of April of 2011 at page 3. Now, you may want to revisit that decision, but we would still submit to you that the likelihood of moving straight to a second trial without an appeal determination of issues in this first case is unlikely and at the very least extremely problematic. So, on this point, we say, bearing in mind the age and the health of the accused and these legal technical challenges of proceeding straight to a second trial after this trial, we'd ask you to do as the Supreme Court Chamber has directed and opt for one smaller trial of some portion of the closing order giving due consideration to these arguments that I made this morning on reasonable representativeness. Thank you. The President, thank you. Now, the lead co-lawyers for the Civil Party, you have the floor. Briefly, Mr. President, on this question, we entirely agree with the prosecutor and believe that it would be highly problematic to start a second trial without having a verdict for the first and perhaps a decision on appeal, if appeal there is, for the simple reason that the first trial, apart from forced transfer, envisages uh, elements that would serve in subsequent trials. Therefore, it seems impossible to do anything except wait for the verdict and the decisions. I, I take note of the suggestion by the Supreme Court to create another panel of judges, if I understood the proposal correctly. I'm not certain I did. I think that would pose a good number of juridical problems as well also problems connected with the internal rules because at the moment they do not provide for any kind of second panel of judges. It would also cause effectiveness problems because if your chamber knows the case file well, I think it would nevertheless take a long time for a new panel to acquaint itself with it. So unfortunate that it may seem, I think we have to await the end of this first trial portion before we even consider another. Thank you. The President, uh, thank you very much. The Chamber will take all the points you have raised into consideration. Now I note the um, uh, Council kind of is on his feet. You may proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. It would help us for our submissions uh, if we would have a point of clarification from the OCP and from the civil parties. If, as I understand their position, 
what they're saying is it is within the legal right of the trial chamber to dismiss any portion it wishes of the closing order. Because if we're only going to have one mini trial or one trial that is sort of a smorgasbord of the closing order, effectively the rest of the, the, uh, the closing order is not going to be tried. It's being dismissed. So the prosecution has already indicated its position, but is part of their position that your honors have the authority to dismiss and not try any other part, because that's effectively what, is, what, they're, what they're suggesting. And that would help us in our submissions. The President, thank you. Mr. Prosecutor, you may proceed. No, we're not saying that at all. And we're saying what we have consistently said is that part of the case would be severed. There is always a prospect that perhaps remotely it may be that one accused may still be fit after this first case has been determined. But bearing in mind all the factors that we see today, that is why we are recommending to you that you proceed with a single trial. We are not recommending that the rest of the case be dismissed at this point. There may come a point when that is the case, but that certainly that situation does not exist today. The case would simply be severed as it was done previously, but on a different basis. Likewise, for us, we never said that either. We endorse the views of the prosecution on this subject. The Chamber simply has to adapt itself to what happens in the future. We just have to take note of that fact, regrettable though it may be. I also want it to be clear whether the defence is making its comments at a later stage or if uh, it's making them now and at a later stage. That would help me in the distribution of our time planning. The President, thank you. The Chamber has made it clear in, its, uh, in the subject of uh, today's hearing. Uh, the the purpose of today's hearing was made clear uh, this morning uh, or from an outset uh, starting this morning, particularly the effort the Chamber is trying to uh, address, that is to enable the uh, trial Chamber to ensure uh, the uh, efficiency uh, of case 002. This is the matter that uh, the Chamber uh, made it uh, abundantly clear uh, to the party. So we would like to hear the view of the chambers, uh, of the party, so that the chamber have the basis uh, to issue a reasoned uh, decision. And we hope that uh, that will not lead to any uh, problems anymore in the future in relation to this issue. Now I hand over to Judge Fence. Just to avoid uh, further, uh, further confusion, I'm rereading the relevant part of the Supreme Court decision, which says, um, if the gist of the severance is judicial manageability, there is a necessity for a tangible plan for the adjudication of the entirety of the charges in the indictment. Now, it might very well be that the issue of judicial manageability comes into the decision of the trial chamber not necessarily as the only, but as one determining factor. Do I understand the prosecution and the civil parties correctly that what they are saying at the moment is the following? They consider it to be a tangible enough plan for the future if the trial chamber aims to have a verdict in a still to be determined scope and makes any further plans as what is to happen with the remainder of the indictment at a later stage. 
that's basically what we said in the original order when we said further determinations about the fate of remaining um, points of the indictment will be made in due course. Now, I take it that this was not specific enough for the Supreme Court. May I ask clarification? Because this is a point raised repeatedly by the Supreme Court, meaning the lack of a tangible plan. I think, and, and, I've, and I've already made these submissions to the court, Judge Fens, but I'll, I'll repeat myself. I think the court, the Supreme Court chamber, is giving you two options. It's, it's essentially stating that if you believe that the only real, realistic prospect is to go forward with a single trial, then that single trial must have some kind of representativeness of the whole case. And that's the position that we would ask you to adopt. Those are our submissions. I think the judicial manageability issue relates to this original proposition that you had for a series of trials. And if you go with that option, the Supreme Court Chamber is saying you've got to come up with a plan, which is what you originally said. But again, I would emphasize our position is that you go with the second option of, of the single trial reasonably representative of the entire indictment. President, thank you. There are two points remaining. The first one is for all the parties starting from the co-prosecutors and the lead co-lawyers. The question is the following. The trial chamber indicated that in the severance order that all remaining allegations in case 002 were not discontinued in consequence of it but would form the subject of future proceedings should circumstances permit. What prejudice has resulted to the parties from the lack of a concrete timetable for these later trials? given that its implementation depends wholly on unknown contingencies, such as the continued fitness to stand trial of all accused, the availability of donor funds to support future trials, and the hypothesis that any subsequent trials may instead be heard by a different trial chamber. Thank you, Your Honours. I can be uh, very brief on this. We appreciate as much as everybody else in this trial chamber the unpredictable factors which have existed in this case and which have made it very difficult for you as a chamber and the parties uh, to manage this case. But I want to be very clear about the prejudice because the Supreme Court chamber expresses, at least in respect of the co-prosecutors, exactly what that prejudice was. Um, and they put that at paragraph 44. You'll find it in the decision. And I will read it for the purposes of the record. In violating their right to a reasoned opinion and their right to be heard and limiting the scope of case 002-001 in a way that unduly disregards reasonable representative representativeness of the indictment, the trial chamber thereby caused prejudice to the co-prosecutors. Now, the right to be heard is being addressed by the chamber now, and we look forward to a fully reasoned decision. But the essence of the prejudice, as far as the co-prosecutors are concerned, in terms of what we seek from this chamber, is representativeness. And we, we feel, we, we, we submit to you, we emphasize that unless you make efforts, absolutely balancing all of the problematic factors of this case, as we've tried to do in making these submissions to you today, 
to ensure that this case addresses the absolute heart of the criminality that we're dealing with, then we will remain prejudiced. Um, the formation of the second chamber, that was actually in this question. I don't have anything to add to what my colleague said. I think it's a, it's a problematic proposition for a whole number of reasons, not, not, not just legal, I think uh, probably financial as well, frankly, with the, with the financial situation that the court is in. I also anticipate that even if it could come about, it would take a considerable period of time for it to be established, for judges to be recruited or moved or what, whatever way it would work. So I think um, as much as the Supreme Court Chamber was trying to come up with creative solutions, it, it's probably one uh, that's not going to work here. Thank you. Thank you. The floor now is given to the lead co-lawyers if you have any observation to make regarding this matter. Thank you, Mr. President. As far as the civil parties are concerned, our position differs slightly, and it uh, is due to the nature of the civil parties and what the prejudice to the civil parties would be if we were not to uh, fix a proper timetable, which was a question addressed to us, to you, in our submission from October 2011. We very much would like to see a concrete timetable. As I stated earlier, the civil parties have chosen to be civil parties with very pointed expectations, the truth, explanations, so on and so forth. And only the ongoing proceedings as they uh, move forward can actually proffer the truth. The civil parties are entirely entitled to have an idea of the nature of future trials, although they understand that it is quite plausible that those future trials may not occur or are driven by uh, random factors, be they financial reasons, reasons uh, which are not controlled by the trial chamber. Nevertheless, the civil parties are owed a certain degree of certainty from the trial chamber so that uh, any decision not be tantamount to a miscarriage of justice. The civil parties believe that the trial chamber seeks to hold consistent trials in order to cover the entirety of this case in closing order. All parties have the responsibility to include this first trial, which concerns forced transfer, within a broader trial, a broader case. And the civil parties must have the impression that the forced transfer does not constitute one single and isolated trial from the rest of the case. It is very important for the civil parties to have the situation that they have succumbed to be acknowledged by the trial chamber and possibly addressed in future trials based on concrete timetables. We believe that it is in our best interest, not only for the civil parties, but for all parties, to understand what the timetable would be so that we can prepare uh, overall strategy. And this is exactly why we are requesting once again the trial chamber to provide a timetable of future trials, even in consideration of uh, random factors and controllable factors that may have an impact on those uh, eventual trials. I believe that this will bring us to a conclusion uh, and that the eighth question is addressed to all defense teams. If the defense teams do not respond to the eighth question, I would recall that uh, the civil parties wish to 
raise three matters directly related to the severance order. I would therefore respectfully uh, seek leave from the child chamber to specify as to whether or not we can address those three issues now or if the child chamber wishes the civil parties to uh, address those matters tomorrow or uh, during the morning session on Wednesday. These three issues are of crucial importance for us and uh, I would very much welcome the opportunity uh, to lay them before you. Thank you. President, the International Lead Co Lawyer for Civil Parties, can you provide a brief account of all the three points that you would like to raise and the reasons behind uh, your request? Please make it brief before the Chamber decides on whether given you the floor. Thank you, President. These three points have been raised in our submission uh, requesting reconsideration of the severance order submitted in October 2011, and those three points were also raised a second time afresh in paragraph 44 of the Supreme Court Chamber's decision in one of its footnotes, which is quite lengthy. Those three matters I'm referring to are firstly whether or not the severance order could apply to the characterization of crimes, and we wish to make a few comments on that matter. And the two other points are rather specific to the civil parties. The first being the nature of the impact of a severance order on the participation of civil parties. And the third point is to determine the impact of uh, the severance order on the distribution of uh, reparations and the awards of reparations. These are very important issues for us. We believe that the trial chamber has uh, provided implicit answers. However, we do uh, seek uh, uh, clarifications in the most uh, unequivocal terms possible. I would require approximately 30 minutes to expand upon these points. Thank you. President, yes, you may proceed. Thank you very much. The first point concerns as to whether or not the severance order has an effect on the characterization of creams. When we had submitted our uh, briefing, the civil parties stated that it was impossible from a judicial point of view. And today we sustain the same position for the following reasons. 
the judicial characterization of crimes is a matter on which the trial chamber can only make a proper judgment once the facts have been adjudicated upon and once uh, the merits of the case have been studied and once the trial chamber has decided whether or not there should be a characterization of the crimes and what uh, it is in right to uh, qualify even with a severance order and a restricted number of factual allegations. It is entirely reasonable to assume that the trial chamber could at the outcome of these proceedings uh, provide a characterization of crimes of genocide or uh, persecution based on religious grounds. Nevertheless, in its severance order, in paragraphs 5 to 7, the trial chamber expressly excluded those two legal characterizations. This is unfounded. We believe that it is important for the severance order to remain focused on the facts. It may apply, apply to uh, persons and facts. However, it cannot apply to the judicial characterization of crimes. We therefore respectfully request the child chamber to exclude the characterization of crimes as they apply to uh, genocide, genocide and other crimes. That is my first point. The second matter, as you evoked earlier, deals with the uh, effect of the severance order on several parties. This is a highly important point which is rooted in the severance order. In our October 2011 submission under paragraph 7, we had raised this very crucial matter and stated uh, the effect at the issuance of the severance order. The Supreme Court chamber had reviewed this matter afresh. As civil party lawyers, we seek certainty that the internal rules upon which the trial chamber is issuing its decisions would correspond uh, directly to the questions that we have raised. We believe that the consolidated group of civil parties in their participation as an entirety forecloses the possibility of an individual impact. In February and September 2010, the internal rules were amended. Henceforth, Rule 23, paragraph 3, is absolutely clear. Civil parties participate individually at the preliminary stage during the trial stages and all successive stages. The civil parties form a consolidated group whose interests are represented by the co-lead lawyers. Following confirmation of those amended rules, there is individual participation of the civil parties during the judicial investigation, and then the civil parties are part and parcel of the consolidated group represented by the co-lead lawyers. Individual participation is therefore annulled. There is no longer the notion of individual interest, even though it is our duty, of course, to take all of those individual interests uh, in consideration in defense of the interests of the consolidated group. A civil party who may have been admitted during the judicial investigation is owed the right to take part in the consolidated group of civil parties and by virtue of his status within the consolidated group, 
He remains, she remains a full-fledged civil party which cannot be contested. No exclusion is possible. To do so, the entire collect consolidated group would have to be uh, annulled or denied. And the notion of individual participation followed by individual analysis would have to be reinstated. It is the view of the civil parties that it is in breach of the rights of the civil parties to place restrictions on their participation as a consolidated group, uh, which would include uh, emphasizing an individual point of view without affording them the full-fledged rights as a consolidated group. Among these rights, there are, notably in the case of a severance order, the right to not be excluded individually, so long as it has been demonstrated that they were victims of the facts being tried during the first trial or the successive trials. The trial chamber clearly set out in its severance order under paragraph 8 that pursuant to the ECCC legal framework, civil parties no longer participate in the proceedings as uh, individual members to acknowledge the personal harm that they may have suffered, but they form a consolidated group whose interests are defended by the civil parties and the lead co-lawyers during the proceedings. Therefore, the severance order, which restricts uh, the scope during the first trial, does not have any impact on the nature of the participation of the civil parties at this particular juncture. We understand what the trial chamber has stated very implicitly, but which is rather clear for us. No civil party may be excluded in these proceedings, regardless of the nature of the severance order. We also believe that the trial chamber has addressed this matter in an indirect manner uh, during the hearing of the first two civil parties, Mr. Roman Yun and Mr. Klan Fit, as well as during the testimony of Mr. Uh, M. Un. All three civil parties have been cross-examined. Uh, they held the status of civil parties, and yet uh, none of the three were actual victims of forced transfer. We believe that the notion of a consolidated group of civil parties is a very particular uh, judicial concept and notion that uh, uh, saw the light of day here at the ECCC. The notion of collective participation is unique and without precedent in the world. It does not exist in a uh, Romano-Germanic uh, legal system, and there is no international jurisprudence with respect to this issue. Civil party participation may be somewhat of a uh, repulsive idea for some, but it is an incontestable legal notion that applies here. All parties have the responsibility to assume this notion, and therefore no civil party may be excluded from the first trial, nor from any future trials, uh, with or without severance, regardless of the definitions uh, ahead, there are over 3,500 civil parties who are affected and victims who are affected. Together, they form one consolidated group. The trial chamber stated this in implicit terms in its severance order. And once again, this is a leading and clear legal notion. We feel that today the trial chamber must confirm this fact in the clearest and most unequivocal terms with the objective to confirm this with the civil parties because there are some civil parties 
who understand that, or who have the feeling of being excluded when the facts of which they suffered harm or which do not concern them directly are not tried. We require a clear and categorical position from the chamber. As there are NGOs which are uh, conducting outreach programs with civil parties, and we also have reparations projects underway. We feel that a very clear response from the trial chamber will also enlighten the public as well as observers who still have uh, questions and doubts over this. Once again, we state that no civil party may be individually excluded uh, because of a severance order or no individual civil party may be excluded as a consequence of a new severance order. This is fundamental. And lastly, the third issue as to whether or not the severance order will have an impact on the awarding of reparations. Once again, the internal rules as well as decisions of the trial chamber have provided very founded and justified reasons. The severance order does not have an effect on the selective uh, awarding of reparations. The internal rules uh, in its modified version from February 2010 in Rule 23 Kankies 1A that reparations must address the harm suffered by the civil party. This is not a matter of uh, a multitude of harms. It is a matter of the harm suffered by the consolidated group of civil parties. The harm is considered collective. This is entirely logical. So long as the civil parties form a consolidated group, they are entitled to a collective reparation awarded to the entire group. Once again, based on the internal rules, the trial chamber in paragraph 8 of its severance order had very uh, clearly envisaged this matter since it stated that civil parties do not participate individually uh, as a consequence of the harm that they may have suffered. The chamber adds that the severance order does not have any effect on the manner in which the co-lead co-lawyers may seek reparations on behalf of this consolidated group of civil parties. In full respect of their rights, if they are asked uh, to no longer participate uh, in these proceedings and to no longer uh, be awarded reparations, these same civil parties cannot be excluded from a collective request based on the severance order, which is defined uh, by its scope and the facts associated. This would be a discriminatory application of the law. And in the interest of um, consistency, Reparations would be rewarded collectively. On the other hand, certain civil parties would be individually excluded on the grounds that they were not victims of certain fa facts and denying individual participation. This is entirely counter to the rights that govern their participation. Before concluding on this topic, and to avert any possible confusion, I would also add that 
The trial chamber additionally asked for reparations requests that would address the crimes dealt with during this trial. This is not in contradiction to what I have just laid out before you. Reparations must be directly associated with the facts being judged and the crimes that have been tried. It may be a day of uh, commemoration that is associated with forced transfer, if forced transfer is the only topic to be dealt with during the first trial. This is a minimum, but it does not exclude other matters. All civil parties must benefit from eventual reparations. We therefore are requesting the trial chamber to confirm this notion and to confirm this statement. That is, to impress upon the civil parties once again that no civil party will be individually excluded in the issuance of a new severance order. We are seeking founded certainty based on legal grounds. We are seeking a very clear response from the trial chamber a response that will then be conveyed to the civil parties, to non-governmental organizations, and to the greater public, as well as observers who are following this. That brings me to my conclusion, Mr. President. I would simply add that by putting these points before you during today's hearings, we are entirely aware of the significance of these points and the weight of what we are stating before the chamber. It is clear for us that we cannot continue to operate under a cloud of uncertainty, uncertainty that uh, may uh, linger because of the trial chamber, but which is inadmissible for us. We therefore very much hope that the trial chamber will provide founded grounds uh, in response to what we have raised. Thank you very much. Thank you. President, the time is now appropriate for today's adjournment. The chamber has heard the requests made by the three defense teams regarding their possible responses to the questions put to the parties by the trial chamber as well as the observations and proposals made by the co-prosecutors and elite co-lawyers that they, they would be in a better position to respond on Wednesday morning as they have yet to consult with their clients a request for appropriate time for such consultation and instruction from their client before they respond to the questions of the trial chamber as well as all the matters raised by the co-prosecutors and the lead co-lawyers. The requests made by the three defense teams are appropriate. For that reason, the chamber will adjourn today's proceeding and will resume on Wednesday, the 20th of February 2013, starting from 9 a.m. This information is for all the relevant staff and personnel and for the general public as well. As for the scheduling of hearing the character of witnesses of Kyosam Pond, that we plan to conduct on the 20 and the 21st of this week will be deferred to appropriate time in the future. 
For that reason, Visu is now instructed to not inviting these two witnesses to the chamber. That is the TCW673 and TCW665. Awaiting further instruction and scheduling by the trial chamber. Security guards translated not to bring a kill some pawn to the courtroom tomorrow, but instead bring kill some pawn to the courtroom on 20th February 2013, that is Wednesday prior to 9 a.m. The court is now adjourned.